Welcome, everybody. Uh, recently, I spent three years drawing over 1,000 tiny objects. Doing that, I learned a whole lot of stuff about making isometric pixel art. Today, I'll be passing that along. I won't be too, talking too much about basic pixel art techniques. Mostly, I'm going to be looking at measurement and consistent drawing in isometric projection. This talk is going to be most relevant to pixel artists, but I'm sure there's plenty of tips and ways of thinking I'll cover that can be useful to many 2D artists. My name is Angus. I'm a freelance video game artist, and I've been doing pixel art for about 15 years. The game I made all these objects for is called Unpacking. Unpacking is a Zen puzzle game about taking items out of boxes and placing them in a room. The game uses this mechanic to tell a story about a character through the things that they own and the places and people they live with. To make the game, I worked closely with Ren, the creative director, uh, who you have to thank for the game's design, this awesome art style, and a large chunk of the game's assets. And Tim, the technical director, who is responsible for unpacking being a game you can actually play and not just some really nice pictures. <laughs> uh, Mishy, Stacy, and Joe also help with the art since it turns out it takes way too long for two people to draw all of this by hand. I worked on a lot of art for the game, but most relevant to today, I drew first pass line art for the majority of items, and I think almost every single rotated item in the game. Unfortunately, not many household objects are just untextured boxes, so I needed to come up with some advanced techniques to do this. As you may have noticed, I'm presenting this in a drawing program. This is a sprite, which is what we use to make unpacking. It turned out to be the best way for me to present this talk as well, because I can show you how the tools work as I go. Uh, if you're drawing pixel art, I highly recommend it. It's amazing software. All right, so first up, uh, what is isometric? Isometric projection is a way of drawing three-dimensional objects in two dimensions. The iso in isometric just means equal. So essentially, isometric just means that each of these axes are equally foreshortened. So each axis is separated by 120 degrees. You might have noticed that the cube on the right is what isometric pixel art usually looks like, which is because isometric pixel art isn't really isometric. Uh, what we care about as pixel artists is actually having the left and right axes, the green and red, uh, recede at a one to two ratio because it looks nice and clean. So technically, pixel artists don't really do isometric drawing. Uh, they do this, which is called dimetric. That's not super important, uh, it's just good to know that the two follow different rules. The main implication of that for us is that the top plane is a different size and shape from the side planes, which I will just demonstrate. Uh, excuse me, struggling with the mouse. I'm working with a piece of paper as a mouse pad. <laughs> um, so yeah, if I just grab the top plane and tilt it to roughly the same ang angle as the side plane, you can see it is absolutely not the same shape. Um, so for doing anything with isometric pixel art, you're going to have two techniques to achieve something depending on which plane you're looking at. With that out of the way, I'm going to go through the techniques I use to draw different kinds of objects. I'm going to start by talking about drawing on a grid, which is something pretty much every pixel artist will be familiar with from making tile sets. Isometric pixel art is a little more complicated, though, since the grid needs to be three-dimensional. Uh, I'll start with a grid like this, where each square is the same size. This is the actual grid we use for unpacking. Each square represents 10 centimeters. It could be any size, depending on the exact concerns of your project are. Uh, for unpacking, the main concern was how small the smallest items would be. Uh, one thing to know about using this grid is that if you want to use it to draw things uh, that tile, uh, your safe drawing, uh, safe drawing zone looks like this left square, which basically just has this top line uh, cut off. Uh, because uh, when you tile these, uh, if you were tiling the full diamond, the, these rows would overlap, basically. So this is a tessellating shape. Uh, so just keep that in mind if you're making tile sets, especially. For unpacking, the main reason we had to worry about it was to make sure objects weren't going to ever look like they were clipping into each other. The other was because we have shadows for each object, and if those overlap, they would multiply together and potentially look bad. I won't be worrying about this too much for the rest of the tutorial, but I thought it was worth mentioning. Okay, so back to the grid. Uh, the next most important aspect is the vertical dimension. 
Uh, this is the base cube that Ren originally came up with for unpacking. By stacking a bunch of these together like building blocks, it's easy enough to come up with the dimensions for an object. You just measure it in real life and then figure out how many of these cubes it fits in. Once you've got the base dimensions, you build your object within those. As long as your art fits within, inside the bounds of that box, uh, you know that it can't overlap with anything outside of it. Uh, for unpacking, the art pipeline started with a list of items for each room. Uh, that list would say how the object should look, which ways it can rotate, and how many of these grid squares it occupies. The first thing I want to do is show off an item that we built early on that poked a hole into this method of measuring things so you can avoid that same pitfall. All right, this is that item. It's a framed drawing. Uh, we actually made quite a lot of stuff before this without any trouble using uh, the grid method. This, uh, the reason this one tripped us up was that it stands upright like this, uh, but it can also rotate to lay flat on the ground like this. Up until this point, any rotation we had done was just to turn things on the ground. Uh, first, I'll show the technique for measuring with grid blocks. This item's dimensions are one by three by five, so you can just copy and paste the blocks to make that shape. Uh, we actually had two other ways to do this. Uh, first was a tool that Tim made to build these shapes in Unity, which was handy for prototyping and playtesting before we had art. Uh, I also just had a huge A sprite file that had every size of grid box up to a certain point that I could copy and paste them from. Uh, so when I first made this item, I just followed the dimensions of the grid box and drew a fun little horse painting in there. And then I proceeded to do the same process, but have the frame laying down. After making the painting a little more childlike, this is what I came up with on the final pass, which looks pretty good. But it bothered me that the ground version was looking kind of stretched out. It's easier to see an animation like this, uh, which is actually a good trick if you're doing rotations. Uh, it's easy to pick up if something looks wonky. You can just feel it stretching out as it lays down. Anyway, I took this problem over to Ren and Tim, and we all agreed that the issue was our grid boxes. Even though they look like cubes and work like cubes, they were actually a little bit short. The problem being that even though it's really obvious how to draw a square in isometric on the ground, uh, if you want to draw a height to match, you usually just kind of eyeball it until it looks right. As artists, the answer to these kinds of problems is often, if it looks right, it is right. But because we were doing these rotations, it was causing trouble. So Tim took the question to Blender and came up with a uh, set up a cube and camera to the correct proportions and determined uh, that this was our new base unit. So it's just, it's literally only two pixels taller. And they both look like cubes to me. Uh, and I'm happy to report that this unit uh, survived the scrutiny of every single thing we threw at it for the rest of the development. Uh, and using it, I was able to fix up the horse drawing. So a minor difference, but they look, uh, they look like the same thing now. Uh, I tell that story just to emphasize that you're going to run into challenges that you could solve using your intuition, but your intuition can guide you in the wrong direction. I learned that lesson many, many times over the course of development. Measurement issues, like I just showed, compound rapidly. You really want to leave as little room for error as possible to avoid problems down the track, especially if you're using a grid for the measurement, make sure that your foundation is rock solid. To show you how to get that solid foundation, I want to talk about some rules. And really, it's just one rule, and that is to use rulers. Uh, to show you how I rule and measure things, I'm going to teach you how to draw a perfect cube. You can then take that cube back and use the grid technique with it, but you can also use these measurement techniques to directly draw objects. I'll start with a little demo of the line tool in Asprite. It works like any line tool that you've encountered, really. So you just click and drag to your point. Uh, but the nice thing that this and most pixel art line tools do is if you hold shift, it will lock to a certain angle. And obviously, this one is especially useful. Uh, there's also a little readout in the bottom left-hand corner here, which I'll be referring to a couple times through the talk. But it usually just tells you uh, some information about whatever the shape is that you're drawing. So in this case, it tells you things like the dimensions of the line, uh, its angle, its length, things like that. 
So back to drawing our cube. The first step uh, to drawing this perfect cube is using the line tool to draw, our, uh, draw out one ground edge of the cube. On the unpacking grid, this line would be 50 centimeters long. Uh, I've drawn this matching the grid perfectly uh, in this case, but you could make it any length, and the technique I'm, I'm about to show will still work. Next, you want to draw a horizontal and a two-to-one line from each end of that line, uh, which finds the equal length on the opposite axis. Another two-to-one line from each corner, and you get a square. Obviously, in this case, you uh, could have just followed the grid squares, uh, but this is a quick way of thinking if you're not working perfectly on the grid. Next, you'll want to draw up from the bottom point at a 60-degree angle. The 60-degree angle comes from some complicated geometry I don't understand, uh, but Blender agrees with it, and it never caused me any trouble once I started using it, so I'm happy to claim that it is accurate. Uh, when drawing a line in a sprite, uh, you can use the little widget in the bottom left-hand corner that I was pointing out before uh, to see the angle of your line. Uh, if I'm drawing this line, which is gonna be really hard on this mouse pad piece of paper, um, but if I'm drawing the line here, it's, it's gonna be 120 degrees when it's right, uh, the correct length, not 60, uh, because a sprite is measuring from uh, directly right. Uh, so yeah, just look for this in the corner. Uh, so once you've got that 60 degree line, draw a vertical line from the left corner to find where those lines intersect. Deciding exactly what pixel is going to uh, be your height is a little tricky since you're restricted by the pixel grid and the answer could usually be a few pixels. Uh, you'll just have to do your, uh, use your best instinct to figure that out. Here I chose the pixel that looks the most in the middle of the line. So, if I look at the 60 degree line going, I can kind of tell that it wants this one to be two pixels long, so I've just chosen the middle as the uh, intersection point. Um, you might be tempted to use the pixel uh, that's below that because it would line up with the grid here, and that feels really nice. Uh, but around the side of accuracy, if you do choose the wrong pixel, it could throw a spanner into the works. I literally made that mistake the first time I drew this tutorial, and then I had to go back and fix it because it was causing me trouble. Uh, so after that, it's just a matter of using a bunch more intersections to draw uh, another square at this height and join it up with the bottom one. Just step through that quickly. Uh, at which point you can erase the occluded lines and fill in the side planes. So that's how you draw a cube. But more importantly, how you can translate a length from the ground dimension into the vertical dimension. Uh, just use that 60 degree intersection rule. Additionally, once you know the length of a line, it's easy enough to subdivide it using basic math. Uh, you can just measure the length of the line in pixels using the line tool. Uh, and in the widget, in the box that I've highlighted, it will tell you the length of the line uh, regardless of its angle. Uh, since isometric pixel art is orthographic, uh, you can just multiply that number by whatever percentage you want. So in this case, it's 50 centimeters long. If I wanted to find a 40 centimeter line, I would just find whatever four-fifths of the length that I measured is. Uh, drawing things using rulers and intersections like I just showed is great, uh, but this is digital art. And we have a copy and pasting, so there are quicker ways to do some of those operations. I do use the intersection technique all the time, though. It's a great way to draw, and a lot of the times it is faster. I'll just go over the same cube again, but this time using tools where it saves me trouble. So we start with the same length on the ground again, but this time I'm just going to copy, paste, and mirror it to get the other sides. Uh, at this point, I don't have a better method for finding the height, so it's a 60 degree intersection method again. And then instead of drawing the square on the bottom, you can just copy and paste it and drag it to the correct height. And then you can just trace down the other edges that you need. Uh, copy and pasting planes is one of the primary techniques I use to draw 3D shapes, since a good portion of them are just flat shapes that have been elongated. You can do the same kind of operation if you'd drawn the side plane first, for example. Uh, 
because you'll be doing this all the time, I just wanted to quickly show an easy way to do it. Uh, the critical step is to uh, measure out the length that uh, you're trying to do first. So that's this black line here. Uh, and then you can just copy and paste the plane that you've drawn. And uh, you just kind of grab it by the pixel that you measured from. And you can just drag it to the end of the other pixel. Uh, and you can do the same vertic vertically. But you would do it more accurately. Um, uh, so that probably seems obvious, but it's good to remember because I do end up uh, moving these shapes with the arrow keys like all the time. It takes forever. Like I'll copy and paste this, and then I'll just be doing this. <laughs> and it's a terrible way to work. Um, so way easier to use your copy paste. Um, so probably 90% of the drawings start this way uh, by turning a flat shape into a 3D shape. Here I'm just showing uh, that by drawing a shape on the ground and copy pasting it you can get pretty complex drawings right away. Then it's really easy to take that shape and add in the details to create your artwork. Another tool that's useful is the rotate tool. It can be used to do one particularly handy thing, which is to take flat planes and rotate them 180 degrees to get their reversed image. Uh, so uh, you can just use the marquee and then grab from the corner here. And again, shift will lock it to certain angles. Uh, and in the one easy thing in pixel art that actually gives you the opposite angle. Um, I use that all the time, rotating items. And it's one of the only transform operations you can do that doesn't mess the pixels up in some way. Uh, additionally, you can use the flip tool to mirror the image. Which is obvious. Uh, but you can't really use it to uh, use either the rotate or flip tools to mirror asymmetrical images. Uh, like if you're looking at this uh, circle in the corner, there's no way to transform it where I will get that circle into this corner. If I flip it, it'll go over here. If I rotate it, it's just uh, it's just completely the wrong shape. It doesn't go there. Um, I will show uh, a way to do that later, though. For now, just make liberal use of copy and pasting and the flip and rotate tools. Just make sure to double check that the operations you're doing are giving you the correct result, and you're not trying to do something that disobeys the measuring rules I covered earlier. That is, don't try to use the flip or rotate tools to translate between the ground and the side plane. And basically, only use them for flat drawings, the one exception being that you can mirror symmetrical 3D objects by flipping them. Um, so if you've ever 3D modeled, this technique should feel pretty familiar. Since you now know how to measure distances accurately, you can find important points of a shape and join them up to start building complicated things very easily. Another useful tip for measuring is that you can find the center point of a plane by just drawing across through it. I use this constantly because it's such a reliable way to halve things. Here I'm just using that measurement to cut the cube in half by using these new points. You can do the same thing to make any shape where you can find the vertices, like this ramp or this pyramid. Basically, as long as the shape is simple enough and you can find the vertices by doing some measurement, this can be an easy way to build shapes, especially sloped shapes like my example. Uh, the other thing that comes up a lot are round shapes like circles, cylinders, spheres, and hemispheres. I'll start with a ground plane circle since it's really simple. Circles on the ground are just ellipses that are half as tall as they are wide. Since we are making squares using lines that are half as tall as they are wide, that should make sense. Um, so to find the width of that ellipse, just find 70.7% the width from each corner of your square you're trying to match. Uh, you can thank Pythagoras for that percentage. Uh, and then half of that length is the height. So that's 50% of the 70%, if that's unclear. Uh, and then you can just draw an ellipse with those dimensions. Again, in A sprite, those dimensions will be in that bottom left-hand corner readout when you're using the ellipse tool. Uh, that's all it takes to get a circle on the ground with a known diameter, which is the important part. Then a sphere with that same diameter is just a perfect circle with the same width as the ellipse, conveniently. Uh, next, I'm going to show you the holy grail of isometric techniques, which is an easy side plane circle. 
Uh, we didn't have a good way to do this for a long time, so we would just kind of hand draw them and try to get them to look right. There's a few tutorials floating around online for how to do this, but they're a bit slow and difficult. Eventually I got sick of that and I came up with a way to do it. This method is actually the only pinned message in the Unpacking Development Discord. We <laughs> used it that often. To make this work, I noticed that a side plane circle was just an ellipse that's tilted over. So I just had to figure out what the proportions of the ellipse were and what the angle of tilt was. I did this by just taking an image from Blender and reverse engineering it. Of any numbers I'm going to give you today, this is definitely the least scientific, uh, but it works really well, and I'm happy with it until someone shows me a better way. So starting with the side plane, you take its width, and you multiply that width by 140%, which gives you the height of the ellipse, and then you multiply uh, that height uh, by 62.5% to get the width of the ellipse. Uh, and then you just draw an ellipse using those dimensions, and you're going to rotate that ellipse by 26 and a half degrees. Uh, 26 and a half degrees is the angle of a two to one line, uh, which means the top and bottom halves of this ellipse are symmetrical. Luckily, Aceprite's ellipse tool is really cool and it lets you tilt ellipses and you actually get a clean pixel line. To do this, you just draw out an ellipse of the correct size and then hold Alt to rotate. Uh, and again, the angle of the circle will be in that bottom corner. So I've got my little cheetah box here. Uh, but again, you can measure out the ellipse using the bottom left-hand corner. Uh, and I just hold Alt, and this is the coolest tool that exists. <laughs> well, I do, except that if I right-click it, uh, it deletes my circle, which does happen. Um, so yeah, as I'm rotating, I'm just looking at that bottom-hand corner. Uh, and I mean, you can just look at the circle as well. If it looks like it's lining up, it's probably pretty good. Uh, but that's... Uh, way easier than any other way anyone does this, I think. Uh, and you'll notice that uh, it's really slightly out, uh, but it's close enough if you just do a little bit of tinkering, you'll get it to fit in your scrap perfectly. Um, since all of these circles have the same diameter, you can use them in concert to subdivide a sphere as well. Uh, that's useful if you need to make uh, use of hemispheres and wedges. Uh, it's also nice, uh, oh, there's my last one. Uh, it's also nice because you can use it to visualize where the top and the bottom of a sphere is, which is great if you need to put it on the ground in the right place. Just find the point you want to sit it on and match it up. Uh, you could also use your measuring techniques to figure this out, since the center of the sphere is the exact center of the circle. Uh, you can just use uh, that using the cross technique if you like. Then, since the diameter of the sphere is equal to the dimensions of the cube, uh, you can just use half of that height. Uh, knowing these cross sections can be useful for drawing things like shadows as well. Uh, if your light source is directly above, you can just take the cross section of the sphere and cast it down directly. Knowing what the cross-section of your object looks like is a great way to make cast shadows. Uh, with these measurements, uh, you can make some basic round shapes now too. Uh, next, I'm just gonna flip through the process of drawing a kind of random bullet shape to demonstrate how you can put these techniques together. So by combining circles with all the measurement techniques I talked about earlier, you can draw pretty much any common 3D shape. Most drawings are gonna start with something like this. Uh, if you keep the dimensions accurate at this stage, even if you start to freehand over it, you can be confident that the object is more or less dimensionally correct. Uh, at this point, I've been assuming that you'll always be drawing things facing in the uh, exact direction of one of your axes. For unpacking, that was actually part of the design, but sometimes you need to go off grid. A great starting point for doing this is utilizing circles. That's because a circle's diameter is equal the whole way around. Knowing that, it's possible to find a length at any angle by drawing a line through the center of an isometric circle. For the clearest example of this, we're gonna try to figure out what this cube from earlier looks like rotated towards the camera. First, draw a circle that matches the ground plane, and then, uh, because you know these two lines are the same length, since they're both the diameter of the circle, uh, you can draw a square like this, 
where the edges are the same length as the diameter of the circle in its horizontal and vertical dimensions. Uh, this is the same square as the base of the isometric uh, cube, but rotated 45 degrees. Uh, and then you can just use the height from earlier to turn it into a cube. Um, so that gives you the same cube from the front. Uh, both of these drawings have the same dimensions, but are at a different angle on the ground. This doesn't always look right to your eye because things stretch out in odd ways and isometric uh, when you rotate them because um, you're going from like literally to half the width as it rotates around, so it does look wonky. Uh, but if I added enough frames to this animation, uh, you would agree that it's correct. <laughs> so I'm gonna do that, uh, but with just a square and not the whole cube. In this case, I've drawn a top-down circle above the perspective circle to help. First, draw the angles you need on the top circle. Um, uh, I've just divided it equally, but you can pick whatever angle you need. And then, find where those lines intersect the edge of the circle. I can then translate those points down and see where they intersect with the edge of my perspective circle. Following that, I can draw a square at each angle I want uh, by just finding the appropriate intersections and joining them. Basically here, I'm just using the top circle as an easy reference. Um, yeah, so if I just do that for each angle of the square, I can make it animate or find the same square that I drew from top down at any angle that I need. This is clearly useful for animation and rotation, but the main point is you can use this to draw objects that aren't aligned to the grid and still maintain dimensional accuracy. You can also use it if you just need to draw shapes that have sides that aren't at 90 degree angles. It's a bit tedious to do things like this though, uh, especially things that are more complicated than a square, which is why I came up with this next method. Warping is a really powerful way to work in isometric. It allows you to just draw and measure things on a flat plane like you're used to, uh, and then use a tool to translate it into isometric. This gels really nicely with all the techniques I've shown so far, and it's gonna allow you to do stuff that would be basically possible without it, impossible without it. This technique allows you to get the same drawing onto each plane without redrawing it by hand. This problem actually came up really early on making unpacking because we have a lot of items that have artwork on the surface that need to be able to rotate. Things like posters, drawings, books, and video games. Since these images usually aren't symmetrical, they can't just be flipped over or else you would get the mirror image. And you can't move them between the side and the ground plane because as I spoke about earlier, those are different shapes. Doing it by hand proved to be impossible immediately. It's just too hard to freehand draw at these angles and everything ends up really wonky. Not to mention how hard it is to draw the exact same thing twice on oddly warped canvases. So I wanted to be able to take uh, to be able to draw the artwork flat on like this and then warp it onto the plane. I also wanted to introduce the smallest number of artifacts so that it could be easily cleaned up, which immediately ruled out Photoshop or Blender since they wouldn't respect, respect the limited color count. The first thing I had to decide was how big this flat drawing should be. Whenever you scale something, you're basically asking the computer to either compress or expand the information in your drawing. If you're scaling down, the computer has the most information about what you drew, so generally that's preferable. I decided to make the drawing the same dimensions as the height of the cube. Since this is the largest dimension of the cube, I knew I would always be scaling down. You could make the drawing any size really, but I, I found that this worked pretty well. So just make a square that has the same dimensions as the height of your cube. Uh, this is the base canvas for the drawing. At this point, it's good to measure out a second canvas, which will help you warp the drawing cor correctly. Uh, this square will have the same dimensions as the width of one of the side planes, or about half the width of the cube. Uh, and then you can just draw your image uh, into the bigger canvas. Even if you only need to get the drawing onto one of the planes, this is still really great since you're just drawing like normal. Drawing directly onto the isometric surface is nearly impossible because it's just so unintuitive. Uh, next, you scale that big canvas onto your small canvas and clean it up a little bit because pixel art scaling is rough. Uh, my thinking usually using this technique is that if after each operation I clean it up by hand, I'll get cleaner results at the end. But it's really dependent on the type of image and what I'm using it for. 
Like, if it's just for reference, it doesn't really matter. But if I'm trying to warp on an actual painting or something, it's nice to clean it up as you go. Uh, the next step is to squish the larger canvas to be the same width as the smaller canvas. Uh, this is so that the big canvas has the same width as the side plane you're trying to warp it onto. Then you can just move it into place and skew it to fit. I'll show you exactly how to do that in a little bit. But as you can see, that was pretty painless and you get a really nice result. Doing this by hand would send you to an early grave and your drawing would still be wrong. You can do something similar to get the top plane, but it takes two warps, like this. Uh, unfortunately, you can't do warps like this in A-Sprite. You should be able to soon, but the tool is in beta at the moment. For now, I'm using another piece of software called Graphic Scale, also great pixel art software. Uh, in Graphic Scale, the tool you'll need is called Slope. Uh, in other software, it's called a skew tool. Essentially what it does is it takes either columns or rows of pixels and it offsets them. The graphic scale tool lets you choose between these horizontal or vertical options and the step input determines how many pixels each row or column is offset from the last. I'll just jump over to graphic scale now to show you the operations. All right, uh, I set these files up earlier but it's usually a good idea to use a canvas that's way bigger than the images you're transforming. Uh, so to do the side plane, uh, you use the slope tool and you want to set it to vertical mode and you'll either use a step of either negative 0.5 or 0.5, uh, basically just depending on which way you want it to slope. Uh, and that's what you have to do. Uh, and then to do the top plane, you are going to use two slopes. The first one is going to be horizontal and that'll be with a step of either negative one and this is why you use a big canvas, by the way. Uh, either negative one or one. Uh, so in this case, it's one. Um, but you can see it's like cut off. Basically, if you do a bigger canvas, there's less chance this will happen. If it does happen, uh, you can just use the scroll tool um, and you can just scroll it back into place. Uh, and then you just use the slope tool again. And this time it's another vertical one uh, with the 0.5. And it's uh, now the correct shape. Um, so the results you get from that are a little bit messed up, but they're pretty easy to clean. And overall, it's far easier than drawing them from scratch. Uh, they're also fairly dimensionally accurate, so as long as you make the original canvas at a known length, uh, you can use this to figure out all kinds of crazy shapes. Uh, you can use that drawing as a base to make 3D shapes without having to do too much measuring. Uh, generally, if you ever need to draw something that's not a square or a circle, uh, you should go for this technique. It was really great for unpacking, especially for hanging clothes. I had this drawing of a woman scaled to the unpacking grid. Uh, the drawing is from Figure Drawing for All It's Worth uh, by Andrew Loomis, by the way. Uh, and then I could just draw the item of clothing over it and I would know that it would be scaled correctly. Then I just used the warping technique uh, and it was really easy to turn this into a uh, into an isometric object with the correct proportions. And this technique is also the way to deal with this asymmetrical rotation issue that I mentioned earlier. Uh, so back to this, if you want to get the circle, this, whoop, this circle here to get on this side here, um, you can just reverse the warping process. So I just skipped over that quickly, but it's, it's the same operations in reverse. Um, and now that you've got a flat version of the drawing, you can flip it or manipulate it however you need really easily. So in this case, we're flipping them horizontally. Uh, and by the way, these little combing artifacts come up a lot when you use this technique on the top plane. Um, they're kind of annoying, but it's easy enough to tell how to clean that up. Um, so in any case, these are flat now. So once we've flipped them, uh, we can just skew them back into place and clean them up again. Uh, and you get a perspective drawing that is flipped. That would be more impressive if I chose something other than an uh, arrow with a circle, but that's what I did. Um, it's really nice to do this if you've drawn a shape in perspective already, and later you just need to uh, draw the mirror image of that shape. I first realized how useful it would be to manipulate planes like this because I needed to flip this kettle around. 
Ren had drawn it from the back angle and it had this kind of odd shaped handle that's not easy to measure. Uh, so I just took my best guess at the flat cross section of the handle and I warped and flipped it to match the angle that I needed. It still takes a bit of work to get uh, from this to a finished object, but as a point of reference, it's really valuable. There's just no other way to rotate complicated shapes like this. It took a while for me to really wrap my head around how useful warping was, but it ended up being my go-to for all kinds of drawing uh, just because it takes so little effort to get really reliable information. The last thing I'm showing today is more of an application of some of these techniques. I'll be demonstrating that you can draw complex objects by leveraging cross sections. One of the most common uses for this is to add a beveled edge to something. You can just create a smaller version of the shape and then shift it up a few pixels in one dimension. It's pretty simple, but it's really effective in adding a little more life to your shapes, and it gives a very powerful 3D effect when you do it properly like this, rather than trying to eyeball it. The other thing you can do is use multiple cross sections of a complicated shape. I'm gonna show this by creating a shape that is basically a star that is extruded and twisted. Not really a useful shape, but I'd already drawn this star and I thought it might look cool. <laughs> so the first step is to create each of these cross section drawings, which are just rotated versions of the star in this case. Uh, but they could be anything, just shapes that represent how the cross section of the desired object changes. First, skew them into the correct plane, and then you can just stack them up. Then, if you just join up the appropriate vertices, uh, you get the shape you're looking for. This is kind of a nonsense shape example, but it's pretty handy. I, <laughs> people are more impressed by that than I was expecting. I'm glad. It, <laughs> my instinct was right. Um, so it's kind of you know, a useless shape, this one, but I use it uh, a lot for organic or unusual things. Uh, really just anything that didn't have a simple geometric shape as its base. So with that, I've shown you essentially every technique I use to draw isometric objects. By applying them correctly, I was able to handle any shape or rotation that I needed to make. This more technical approach is really great for building games since you can rely on the fact that anything you draw is going to fit together with anything else. If you couple these techniques with your own artistic skills, you'll find that you can easily produce really beautiful art that has a very convincing three-dimensional look. I hope you learned something useful today. If you want to refer back to anything I talked about, you can find a shorter version of the tutorial on my website. I went into a bit more detail today, though, so if you want to review anything from this presentation, feel free to contact me by email or Twitter DM. I'm happy to chat. So we should have a few minutes to take questions, but thank you for coming to my presentation. How are you? <laughs> Good, thanks. First of all, I really like the explanations, like the visual explanations. It was like ancient Greek mathematical <laughs> proofs, kind of. <laughs> so that was cool. I'm um, glad. Secondly, when you rescaled your base units, mm -hmm. did, did you have to like rescale a lot of assets along with that that was already done? Um, luckily, when that happened, we were pretty early, and most of the assets weren't didn't have much of a vertical dimension. I and see. Um, we only had like two rooms drawn at that point, so. Um, yeah, because um, if, for example, you had a lot and yep. you know, when you rescale, it can turn out wonky and not, not right. Yeah. Like if you just rescale one dimension, do you, would you have any like tips or ideas to how to do it the, more easily? I, as far as I know, there's no easy way to do that if you need to rescale your objects. For yeah. us, we just kind of decided like, it's fine, yeah. <laughs> like, because it's pixel art and the 3D is fake. Mm -hmm. um, the main concern with it, right, is objects wouldn't look like they fit in shelves and things with a set height. Yeah. Uh, but because it's pixel art, it actually didn't matter if they didn't fit because they'd just kind of be hidden by the top shelf. So, yeah. Um, yeah, we basically didn't find any objects where it was a major concern. As long as it doesn't look too wonky. Yeah, so, right, but yeah. unfortunately, you pretty much can't scale once you've once you've started drawing the. Um, 3D object, the only way to manipulate it effectively is to transform it back into two dimensions and then 
um, scale it there and rebuild the objects. So, I see. Yeah, that's why it's so, so important to get that right. Yeah. Awesome. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, so which asset ended up being the hardest to make in the end? Uh, okay, I wouldn't say, I don't think I could say any particular asset. Well, if I did, it wouldn't be an object. It would be the title screen mm. because it was very, very big. Um, but uh, of the objects, it was the shoes. <laughs> the shoes were so hard because one of the requirements was that you can kind of tell which one's the left shoe and which one's the right shoe. So first of all, I had to draw them all twice. Uh, and second of all, they're just, shoes are the weirdest shape. They're, there's nothing easy about a shoe. Uh, and there are a lot of them in the game, so, yeah, it's shoes. The one with the Chemex? Yeah. Which one? The Chemex, the coffee. Uh, uh, oh, yeah, we have a crazy glass that's kind of like <laughs> this sort of weird shape. That did actually take me ages, but it's, uh, uh, it's, it's symmetrical. It's round, so I only had to do it once. The hard part is always matching them up. Yeah, I actually I built that with, basically I just took, um, sorry, Ren's just saying that it had um, multiple components to it, like so it wasn't just a glass jar, it also had a, um, a, a like a wooden sleeve around it, it's a coffee pot, so uh, it's just to protect your hand and a spout and other things. Uh, so to draw it, I basically just drew each of those components separately and because I knew the measurements were accurate, uh, I could draw them separately, measure them, and just kind of plug them all together, kind of like working in 3D. You just put them over them and it works. So, yeah. <laughs> so this is kind of a dumb question, but uh, I know you've been using Ace Sprite, and I noticed you were using another software earlier for the yes. uh, skewing. Is there any preference for software, or is this just kind of a any software will work kind of deal? Uh, if you're just, if you were just straight up drawing one thing, um, I kind of think all pixel art software works pretty well. But if you're making a game, a sprite is really good because um, it does something that most um, software doesn't do, which is really good layers and really good frames. And um, we didn't use it too much for unpacking, but if you have a look at the screen, I've like put notations on sections of frames and. Like these ones are highlighted green because they let um, a sprite lets you insert uh, this stuff called user data. In this case, it's a color, but you can put text in there and stuff. And then you can uh, access all of that information using Lua scripts. So it's incredible to use this software because you can write a script and output all of the art that you've done automatically. Um, if you are a pixel artist, I'm sure exporting your work is like your least favorite part of the whole process. And Aceprite gives you the tools to automate it, like, absolutely. So, yeah, Aceprite is amazing for that. Uh, just to follow, what was the sure. software you using for the slopes earlier? Um, that's Graphic Scale, which is, like, it was the gold standard, like, 10 years ago. And it was what I was using until Ren made me change to Aceprite, and now I'm never going back. <laughs> uh, so Aceprite does do the slopes um, yep. internally. Okay, awesome. Thank yeah, you. The, the beta tool for Aceprite can do the same thing, but it doesn't have that nice feature where it locks, it goes by the angle and stuff, so it's, it's way more tricky to use, but hopefully in the future you can do this with it. I, I was just wondering how you handle uh, changes in lighting. Do you have to hand draw each different direction, or is there something you can do, uh, do with that? Happily, we decided, well, Ren decided early on that the light source was going to be directly above. Um, so technically, objects do have... Um, yeah, let's see, like the computer screen, like one side is darker, um, but we just flipped them. I don't think anyone has ever noticed uh, the lighting. So just by having the light source on top, it pretty much let us skirt the whole issue. Uh, sometimes I did do it though, just because I was so used to putting the dark side on one side. So if I flipped an object and had to completely redraw it, you know, <laughs> I just go with my instinct. Hi. Hello. Hello. <laughs> um, it's better. Uh, I, I have a question, but I'm not too sure if um, you could answer it. Would be uh, extremely sure. good if you can. I'll try. Is um, when you have completed, like, 
when you draw all this uh, pixel art, do you mean like you have to draw every single rotation of it? Yes, yeah. For us, it was all manual. So um, we, every object in the game didn't rotate all four dimensions. And like a lot of them just rotate once and they flip and they're symmetrical. So I didn't have to do anything. Mm -hmm. But for a pretty huge number of the objects, you um, have to manually draw the different angles because there's just no other way to do it in 2D. Yeah. Um, yeah, it is what it is. It was definitely one of the hardest parts of the project. And um, was it then exported as a sprite sheet, or was it just all um, individually coded um, to change the sprite whenever you rotate it? True. Uh, so the way we set up our files, unfortunately I don't have one here to show, but we um, basically we take a big A sprite file like this, and then we had our background art in the file and all of the items in the file with each of their rotations, and because A-Sprite has great layer management, uh, each image was labeled according to what direction it was rotated. Uh, and then we had a script that exported everything with the names and then that imported into Unity. Uh, and uh, because uh, all the objects are based on the grid system, basically you just dump them in and if the uh, art file says this is the flipped version, then the uh, Unity project will just uh, choose that uh, art when you flip it. There was a bit of manual loading and stuff, but yeah, basically it was all individual images with automated export. All right, thank you very much, that's all. Uh, no problem. Oh, yeah, that is true, yeah. There's like a, a Sprite Atlas, but um, that we never had to work with those. It was all individual assets. Cool, I think that's it. Uh, thank you everyone for coming to my talk.